Hello, I am Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse and Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Dr. Robert Beekner, joining us today for the webinar entitled The Student-Centered Active Learning Environment with Upside-Down Pedagogies often referred to as the Scale Up Project. Dr. Beekner currently serves as a member of the physics faculty at North Carolina State University, where he is also the founding director of the STEM initiative for the university. Dr. Beekner's experience in education is vast, as he has held numerous positions which included visiting professor in physics, director of the physics graduate programs, and an American Council Education Fellow distinction. While the roles may have varied, Dr. Beekner has continued to be actively involved in efforts to advance science education. As a result, he has received awards for outstanding leadership in K-16 education and is a prolific writer and presenter. Thank you, Dr. Beekner, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. During today's webinar, the ASEF staff will be assisting Dr. Beekner and all participants. At the conclusion of today's session, we will provide a list of links that will help you take advantage of the many services and opportunities ASEF offers. In addition, we invite you to join our mailing list for important updates and events as well. Before we start our session, I want to make mention of a few important items that will enhance your webinar experience. Please make note of the many interface options available on your Saba Centra screen. Participants may reply yes or no in response to the presenter, laugh, applaud, and step out. You may raise your hand for a question, but we would prefer you send your questions through text chat. The text chat button will allow you to send questions to the presenter throughout the presentation. The speaker has an allotted time to address questions that the audience may have. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented engage with the speaker, and add to your professional. Well, hello everyone. This uh, webinar is about the uh, Scale Up Project. The, uh, the name Scale Up stands for Student-Centered Active Learning Environment with Upside-Down Pedagogies, and we'll be talking about each of the different parts of that. Uh, on this particular screen, you can see uh, one of the probably more well-known Scale Up classrooms at MIT. Uh, they actually call their project TEAL for Technology Enhanced Active Learning. Uh, everyone knows you have to have your own acronym. Uh, and then uh, that map, it's a Google map of many of the sites. There's about 150 universities uh, and a few high schools and middle schools that have adopted the uh, scale-up approach in the U.S. primarily, but also around the world. What I'd like to do is uh, sort of divide this webinar up into two parts. Um, the first part will be sort of setting the stage for uh, why we would even want to, to do the kinds of things that, that we'll be talking about in the second part. So essentially setting the context. And so we'll begin with um, examining exactly what the problem is and then we'll figure out ways to respond to that. So the, the problem, as you might suspect, is that students aren't learning as much as we would like them to. There is a, uh, a study that was released just in January of 2011 that, that was about the National Assessment of Educational Progress and uh, then a, uh, another paper that came out, or a book actually, uh, by Aram and Roxa called Academically Adrift. You may have heard about that. And basically it says that uh, our students aren't doing very well. Only 21% uh, of our seniors are proficient. And an example of proficiency is knowing the difference between a star and a planet. So that's, that's not saying much. And then there's also the, there's some data that shows that students really didn't show any significant improvement in learning or in doing uh, uh, conceptual problem solving or uh, things like that. Uh, critical thinking even after four years. So uh, students simply are not learning as much as we would like them to. Of course there's also the problem that uh, they're also not enjoying it as much as we want. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from a president of the University of Indiana uh, from many years ago. Education is one of the few things a person's willing to pay for. 
and not get. If you imagine a scenario where a teacher puts a sign on the classroom door that says, class canceled today, there would be rejoicing in the hallways. Whereas if there was a music venue somewhere and a sign went up that said, concert canceled today, uh, well, people aren't quite as happy about that. Well, we certainly can't expect uh, students to enjoy our education uh, as much as entertainment, perhaps, but we should at le they should at least uh, like it some and, in fact, have some understanding as to why someone would want to devote their entire career to a particular subject area. They should be able to appreciate it that way, and we're not seeing that very much. Another difficulty is that uh, students are different than they used to be. I, I say they are more intellectually diverse, and you can think about what that means. Back in uh, the early 70s when I graduated from high school, uh, fewer than half of all high school graduates uh, went on to college right away. And uh, now, actually it's even higher than this, now in, in, in 2007 we were up to over two-thirds. And so the, the question is, what do you do with that extra 20%, where we went from 47 to 67 uh, percent, what do you do with that extra 20% that never used to uh, attend college? Um, you can be sure that most of them are not from the upper parts of the uh, academic scale, whatever your scale might be, motivation, ability, background, um, achievement, anything. They're more towards the lower part, and so the question is, what do you do with them? Some, might, some people might say, well, you simply fail them, and that's, that's what we've been doing. The problem is that we can't afford to keep doing that. This is something called the STEM pipeline. You may have heard of this phrase. STEM stands for um, science, technology, engineering, and math. And the pipeline refers to the fact that we start with a lot of students and we get into smaller and smaller and smaller pipelines, pipes of students, so to speak. So that, for example, of the more than 4 million ninth graders that uh, were uh, in, in ninth grade in 2001, by the time they graduated last May from college, fewer than 170,000, about 166,000 of them were STEM majors. And that's nationwide. Uh, so we go from 4 million down to 170,000. So most of the students are leaking out of that pipeline. So in fact, we are somehow losing them, uh, whether it's through failure at the college level or just dissuading them from pursuing a STEM career. Somehow they're not making it through to where we would like them to be. And there's a lot of data, I'm sure you've seen some of these reports, that show that we simply can't afford to let that keep happening. The, uh, if we want to maintain our place in the world and maintain our uh, technological advantage, but also our standard of living, we have to find some way to produce more scientists and engineers. Another problem, or another difference, I guess, it's not so much a problem, but students are different these days. They are what Mark Prensky called digital natives. Quarters of the kids that are four and under use a computer, and in fact, more than a quarter that are six and under use one every day. Prensky's idea of digital natives dealt with the fact that uh, he was making the analogy, if you like, to le learning a language. If you learn a language when you're very young, when the brain is still forming, then you will speak that language as a native speaker. These kids are learning to use computers when they're very young. They become digital natives. If you learn a language later in life, in college or after that, you will always speak with an accent. I mean, you, you could learn Spanish at age 20, move to Mexico, and in 50 years you'll be the 70-year-old person with an American accent. Um, it's just because the brain works a little bit differently, grows differently early on. And so as kids be have been using technology so much, that is affecting uh, how their brains are forming. The average teenager sends a text every 12 minutes while they're awake. So it's, it's pretty amazing. The kids have been using Google since they first learned to read. Uh, Google is a little over 10 years old. Uh, they learn to read around the time they're six or so, at least you know, in, in, uh, in grade school. So they are used to Google. They expect Google to be there. And so the net result is that they think differently with technology. This is the way that my students uh, take notes. They use their phones. If there's something important, they'll just take a picture of it. The first time that I saw a student uh, doing that, I went over to them and I, you know, I said, show me your phone. And, and I looked at it, and I couldn't really see me very much because the screen was so small. And I asked him, can you read this? And they said, no, but I printed it out. And he opened up his notebook, and he had page after page after page of photographs of the whiteboards. And, and they were full size. And he had written his own you know, little comments on them. It was brilliant. And I never would have thought of that because you know, I've always thought that telephones were these things that you used to talk to people. When, in fact, uh, kids nowadays are using them for many, many different things besides just plain verbal communication. 
so so what's happening is that because the brain changes, uh, the, the brain is plastic in the, not the plastic model sense, but formable. That's something that's, that's a fairly new idea. A couple of decades ago, we, we thought that you were born with a certain number of brain cells, and that's all you had. Uh, well, now we know that it's not so much the number of brain cells that matters, but the interconnections, and those change all the time. You literally rewire your brain every time you're exposed to anything. Uh, and so as you become an expert, there's something called Hebb's rule in cognitive science, neurons that fire together, wire together. As you practice something, as you play the piano over and over again, or as you work problems in the back of a chapter, or as you read uh, classic literature, whatever it is that you do to, to make yourself an expert, you rewire your brain. And what that means is that you end up literally thinking differently than students do who are not experts. And so that makes it more difficult for teachers to, to explain things to students. Things that are perfectly obvious, trivially obvious to a teacher may not be, certainly are not, to, to the student. So that makes it hard to teach. Uh, another thing that's changed is the, the fact that Google is out there. Uh, we've gone from information scarcity to abundance. Uh, you can see from this screen, I did a Google search on the word Google, and it found almost 12 billion hits, and it took less than a tenth of a second to do that. I mean, I use Google every day, and I still can't really believe it. But it's there, and, and students have learned to use that. And so uh, that changes things. That actually changes their opinions of us. This is a great quote uh, from the Chronicle of Higher Education. Students have had the world at their fingertips their whole lives. And because of that, that actually undermines their view of us as authorities. Because they know that unless the, the lecturer, the teacher, happens to have done research in a particular area that they're lecturing about and hasn't published yet, then they can probably find something that's more recent on their little phone within 30 seconds than they're getting from the class. And so that changes how students view us. Uh, another thing is that students now have options that they never used to. Uh, you may have heard of the University of Phoenix. Uh, you know, if they ever get to be big, we're in trouble. Well, they have almost 500,000 students, and they, their venture capital fund is huge. But the real problem is that they are accredited by many of the same agencies that accredit brick and mortar institutions. And so uh, students can take courses there, and it's very difficult for a, a university to not accept those credits. And so what's going to happen if students start taking all of their intro-level courses online? They're used to getting their information online anyway. It's a whole lot more convenient to get it online. And so what's going to happen when they start coming and saying, hey, I want to matriculate as a junior? Well, we're going to be losing lots of faculty jobs if we don't figure out a way to add value for them to come to the brick-and-mortar institution. And so... This, the problem is that this is not the best option for students. A lecture hall is not the best option for students. In fact, we know that the way lecture halls usually work is it, it's more like this. And so we need to find a way to address that. This is certainly not what students uh, want to be doing, and we don't want them to be doing that either. So the problem is that students aren't learning as much. They're not enjoying it. They're digital natives, which makes it difficult for us to talk to them. We've become experts. So again, that makes it even more difficult for us to talk to them. And they're used to having information at their fingertips, and that's changing their view. And with all the options that are available to them, we have to do something. So what is it that we should do? And probably the first thing is to realize that in the same sense that a pile of bricks is not a building, just having access to information doesn't really give you knowledge, doesn't give you wisdom, doesn't really show you how to apply that information. We need to recognize that, and we need to make sure that our students understand that as well. But it turns out there's, there is one thing that we've got that's a big, big advantage over uh, uh, virtual universities, and I like to call that our trump card. And it's, uh, it came out of this study by Alexander Aston. It's a huge study, 20-some thousand students. They surveyed them across the, uh, the U.S., and essentially what they did was try to characterize them. What was it about students that was correlated with success in college? What mattered in college, basically? I mean, that's where the title came from. And so they asked them all sorts of things, the obvious questions like race and gender and socioeconomic status, but also things like educational level of parents, what kinds of reading material was in the home, uh, what sort of college did you attend, how many hours a week did you spend doing homework, how many hours a week did you spend in the library, did you participate in intramural sports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it turns out they found one thing that correlated more strongly than anything else with success in college, and that was the quality of the relationships that students had 
either with a faculty member or with other students. Basically, if someone cares how you do, you tend to do better. So, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but it's nice that that's been shown by uh, really rigorous research. It's relationships. It's the people that are at the brick and mortar institution that are the, the real benefit of going to, uh, to a university or college. Uh, that's our trump card. Now, your, your response might be, well, I mean, there's online communication and relationships. There's things like Facebook. But if Facebook was uh, so great, there wouldn't be uh, college parties. Right? So uh, we realize that people need to see each other. So Facebook hasn't replaced parties. And so we know, in fact, that there is a reason that people, people are wired to respond to other people in person. Even, even sites like eHarmony. People go on that not to find an email or a chat pal. They go to find a real flesh and blood, warm human being. And so we are wired to respond to human beings in person. And the advantage of a college or university is that we bring people together. Uh, another thing that we need to do when, as we re figure out how to respond to the changing times is that we don't want to waste people's talents. You might recognize up in the upper right corner there, uh, that's a, uh, a row full of telephone operators uh, working sometime back in the 30s probably, and uh, that's a, essentially a network router. Uh, and then the, the, the big picture there, it's actually one of my favorite pictures. I have it hanging right over there in my office uh, as inspiration. This is a 1924 computer room of the uh, Veterans Bureau, and the, com uh, the computer it, computers are calculating uh, veterans' benefits from the First World War. And the thing that's interesting about this is that uh, this room full of uh, 1924 vintage computers, I'm not talking about the adding machines talking about the women. In fact, if you were to look at their job description, it would say computer, because that's what they did all day long, was they computed, they calculated. Well, clearly we don't do that anymore. That would be a waste of people's talents. It's, you know, a plug-in computer is a lot faster, it's a lot more accurate. It doesn't get sick, it doesn't take vacations. If it doesn't work, you call in the IT folks, and if that doesn't work, you toss it out and you buy a new one. There's no health care costs, no retirement benefits. So. That would be a waste of people's talents to have them do that kind of thing. Well, in the same sense, standing in front of a room full of students and talking at them, we don't need to do that anymore. There are a lot better ways to deliver that information. I tell faculty if they can be replaced by an iPod, they probably will be uh, because uh, it's a lot more convenient for students to be able to play the, the lecture whenever they want. They can back it up and play it again when they miss something or fall asleep. Uh, within a year or so, they'll be automatically transcribed, probably, and so they'll be able to do rapid searches. So instead of, of wasting a faculty member's time and have them stand up in the front and, and say the same things semester after semester after semester, why not deliver that information outside the classroom and save the valuable class time when you've got that expert there and have the, that expert do the things that a human can do, the kinds of things that, in this case, Socrates, you can see, is, is asking questions diagnosing what a student is thinking, empathizing with them, ask them, leading them through a thought process. You can't do that with computers. I mean, the artificial intelligence folks you know, say that that's 10 years away, but they've been telling us that for decades. So we, we have at least until 2022 uh, before we have to worry about that kind of thing. And so that's the best way to respond is to, to attack it in several different ways, recognize that information access isn't the whole thing. Uh, we need to take advantage of the fact that there are people and, and we are wired to respond to people. We don't want to waste people's talents. We want to take advantage of the skills that they have. It's, it's interesting, though, I think, if you'll in, uh, allow me to uh, indulge myself here on a little bit of history, it's interesting to look at how we got into the situation in the first place. Uh, the Greeks invented these uh, spaces we call now uh, auditorium. If, you have, uh, if you're able to read those Greek letters in the lower left there, it's the word theater. This is the theatron of, or the theater of Dionysus. It's in Athens. It's not far from the Acropolis. And theater refers to the seating area. That's a viewing area. And people could sit there and, and watch the plays, the Greek tragedies and things like that, or uh, attend religious festivals. This is the you know, theater of Dionysus was one of the, I think Dionysus was the god of wine or something. Uh, and it worked very, very well for that. The Romans got a hold of this idea. They focused on the listening aspect, so audio. So there's an audience, and this is called an auditorium. But the same, it's the same idea. One, a small number of people can communicate with a large number of people uh, simultaneously. It was not used for education, however. Uh, the Greeks did education this way, with social interaction. Socrates asked questions. Plato would pose situations for people to think about. Aristotle 
Pythagoras, all these folks were interacting with people. Now, with small numbers of people, disciples, actually, at the time, they were called disciples because we didn't have good ways to, to talk to, uh, to teach lots of people at once. In fact, that came about a little bit later when uh, Pope Gregory VII decided that the, uh, the clergy needed to be educated, which back then was important because they literally had the power of life and death over people, and actually they had the power of life and afterlife over people uh, because they could take you out of this world and make sure that the next one didn't go so well for you either. So in 1079, he decided that the clergy need to be educated in the doctrine of the church to make sure everyone was saying the same things. The problem was that there were a lot of clergy, and no one had ever tried to educate a lot of people at one time like that. So it turns out it would have been nice to be able to use Gutenberg's Bible, but that hadn't been created yet. It wouldn't be for almost 400 years. But they were really, really clever. They used the technologies that they had and the skills that people had. Monks were incredibly good at copying. They would spend their entire lives uh, copying scripture. And then uh, the, the monks lived in monasteries. The people you wanted to educate lived in monasteries that had auditorium spaces. So what they did was they would put the monks in these lecture halls, and they would have a lecturer. Well, they put them in the auditorium. Then they called them a lecture hall because a lecturer literally is a reader who would come in and read their handwritten manuscript, and all the monks would faithfully copy it down. They wouldn't discuss it or anything. they just copy it down. And when they were all done, then they would have their own book, and they could go out and hire themselves out as lecturers as well. And that worked really well. It was a very clever use of technology. Um, the difficulty is we are still doing that a thousand years later. We don't need to distribute information that way. There are a lot better ways to do it. Books are printed. There's photocopy machines, and now we've got multimedia. So there's just lots of better ways to distribute information than uh, in a lecture hall even though we've been doing it for a thousand years. The difficulty with lecturing is it treats all students as if they're the same, except maybe the students in the back can hear better and see better, but otherwise everybody gets the same instruction. But the real problem is it treats the students as if they're the same as the professor, because the professor actually learns, probably learned pretty well in a lecture hall. Professors are among some of the best students around. That's how they got to be professors. Uh, it's also hard to engage students, unless you put on a big show of some kind. It's, it's nearly impossible to give individual assistance just because there's so many people and you can't get to them. So what ends up happening is that students recognize they're not getting much out of it. They quit coming. The success rates go down. I've, I've got the word success in quotes because uh, what happens is students don't learn as much. The professors have to dumb down the tests and they complain students aren't as good as they used to be. And in fact, they're, you know, the, the average is actually shifted down because we've got more of that 20% remember. So that, on average, that's true. But in, anyway, the, the net effect is that students don't learn. And of course, that's, that's the, where we had the problem. The real difficulty, of course, is it works. It has worked for the faculty. And so they tend to teach the way that they were taught, and it worked for them. OK, so that's sort of the situation, how we got into this. Case. Uh, and then and, and the social situation has changed. The technology situation has changed. What do we do about it? In fact, specifically, what did scale up do? Well, we redesigned the classroom environment. This is another picture of that uh, MIT's classroom. You can see it almost looks like a, a restaurant in a sense. It's a very comfortable, inviting space, but it's been redesigned to facilitate interactions. Remember, it's those relationships between people that matter. So the room has been redesigned to facilitate those interactions between people, taking advantage of our trump card. It's called a studio. It's not a new idea. You're probably familiar with art studios and dance studios. Uh, up in the upper right corner, that's a uh, civil engineering studio from uh, West Point in 1922. And then the, the bottom corner, bottom right picture is a little more recent. That's uh, my grandson's cl uh, kindergarten classroom, but it's also a studio. Uh, same idea. And so here's, here's kind of the big picture. There are round tables, and they're designed so the students are looking at each other. And, and we actually did a lot of research. We tried uh, four different diameter tables. Once we decided that they should be round, then we tried four different diameters to find out what would work best. And we found that seven foot diameters with three teams of three students at each one seems to work the best. And if we go with, uh, we can put more students at a table if you make the tables bigger, but then it's hard to speak across the table. Uh, if you make the tables much smaller, then uh, while well, you can go to, to, to smaller numbers of students, we want them to work in teams since that's a skill that employers want, but then uh, an ideal academic team is about three people. So then you're, it's nine or down to six, and at that point there's not many people to help. It just works out, we've done the research, it works out best with nine students at seven foot tables that are at least five feet apart so that the instructor can uh, get to everyone. There's no hiding. 
So there's eight, three, le three teams of three at every table. Uh, we label them A, B, and C, and the tables are, are numbered. And the teacher station we found works best somewhere near the middle of the room. If it's at the edge of the room, the teacher tends to want to write on the whiteboard or the blackboards too much. So we want the teacher to be talking less and the students to be working more. Uh, there are whiteboards all the way around on uh, all the wall surfaces, if possible. And there's also group size whiteboards. The idea of a whiteboard is that the students have to write in, with large letters so the teacher can walk by and easily see what they're doing. Whereas if they're writing on paper, it's much more difficult to, to keep an eye on what's going on. And if one team of three students has one whiteboard, then they have to collaborate in order to, to solve the problem. And it also makes it easier for them to hold that whiteboard up so that uh, everyone can see what they've done. There's name tags for every student. Nobody's anonymous. And, and you can see, see we've had some fairly famous teacher or students here. Um, but the idea is, again, that, that there's a more of a connection. The teacher gets to know every student by name. I've got this semester, I have 100 students in my class. I know every single one by name. It takes a little while to do that, but with name tags, it's not nearly as hard as you would think. Uh, there's also things like a homework lottery and things like that. Again, to get responsibility on the students without adding lots and lots of work to the instructor. Here, what that means is that Table 4 has to hand in written solutions to work that was done online uh, in order to get full credit for it. And then there's another thing that, that where we have students pass notes back and forth, uh, again, to share ideas with each other. So the, the UP in Scale Up stands for Upside Down Pedagogies. It's a backwards design in the flipped classroom. And there's several aspects of that. One is there are performance outcomes. What do you want students to do? That leads to an assessment. You know, you basically, you ask students to do those things. And then that lets you think about what kinds of tasks do I need to have students do? What kind of instruction do I want? So instructional design happens last instead of first. So that's why that's backwards. Most of the time, the students are teaching each other. So the students become teachers. That's backwards. And then uh, the last thing is you may have heard it called the inverted or flipped classroom. A lot, if not most, of the content delivery happens outside of the classroom. So it's switched. What used to happen in the classroom, content delivery, happens outside the classroom. And the struggling with the hard applications, which used to be done exclusively in homework, now happens in the classroom when you've got peers to help as well as an expert. A typical class, it varies from school to school. Uh, at NC State, we went from three hours of lecture plus two hours of lab, so now it's five hours a week. Typically, we start with a simple lecture, because lectures are good at, at helping students to organize the material and to motivate them, but they don't actually learn much beyond that. So then we have them do activities that we call tangibles or ponderables. Tangibles are, are measurements. Ponderables are interesting problems. Visibles are simulations. They do that for 10 or 15 minutes. Then we discuss it. They do another activity for 10 or 15 minutes. We discuss it. And we just keep doing that until we get to the end. And then we summarize. So that's a typical class. Did it work or not? We've got a lot of data on that. We've got data that shows all these things, that, that they're better problem solvers. Their conceptual learning is much better. They don't drop out nearly as much. And an interesting thing is that the best students in the class tend to benefit the most. The weaker students benefit more than anybody in the lecture section, but the top students benefit the most. They even do better in later classes, and their attitudes about schooling are better. This is an example of from some data from NC State taken over five years with more than 16,000 students. And you can see that uh, for the scale-up classes, that first pair of bars are under overall. That shows that the failure rate overall has dropped by a factor of three. Uh, for women, that's a factor of five that it dropped, and for African Americans, a factor of four. So the, the, the thing that I like about this is that if you look across the scale-up demographics, they're fairly flat. It, it doesn't matter so much anymore if you're female or Native American or African American or Hispanic. You tend to do well in a uh, scale-up classroom. So where are we? Uh, well, there's lots and lots of installations. There's a, at least 150. Uh, the largest room that I know of is, I think there's 160 at the University of Virginia Medical Center. I know the Univers University of Minnesota has a whole building with 20 of these rooms in it, and they're looking for a space big enough to handle 180. Most of the applications, it turns out, most of the adoptions are smaller, maybe 30 or 40 or 50 students. But it does work uh, nearly as well with, uh, with that large number. If you've got questions, uh, here's just some more pictures. If you have questions ab about the scale-up procedure or what's involved, uh, you can email me. That's my uh, last name, B-I-C-H-N-E-R at ncsu.edu. And a good place to start is by going to the ScaleUp website, scaleup.ncsu.edu. That's actually divided up into two parts. So if you just go there and visit, you'll be able to see uh, general information, some frequently asked questions, lots and lots of pictures. I think there's 70 or 80 different 
adopting sites that have information up there with contact information. And you can do searches for who's, you know, who's teaching chemistry, uh, things like that. But then if, if you send me an email, I can give you better access, complete access, actually. And you can get some things related to building codes. You can get layouts, sample layouts of room. You can get instructional things, stuff like that. So uh, there's a lot of information that's available. And just to, to get a start on it, why don't we open this up to questions, and uh, we'll see if I can answer anything that might be remaining in your minds. So I see one here. How does technology play a role in the classroom design of a scale-up classroom? I consider the most important technology in the room to be the round tables, which is perhaps different than what you were expecting. Technology used to be a word long before computers came along. Uh, a technology is a designed solution to a particular problem. And the problem that I had was, how can I arrange this classroom so that students can interact with each other and I can get to everyone so that I can interact with them? And so that's where we did the, uh, the careful design of the tables. I mean, we literally tried all these. We, first of all, we tried different shapes. We realized that students sitting at a rectangular table side by side had a hard time collaborating just because everybody got sti stiff necks looking like this. Once we decided on round tables, we, uh, as I mentioned before, we tried four different sizes. And we, would, we built them. We would have students assigned to those tables. We would videotape them. We would have observers uh, taking field notes about the interactions that they were having. We would have focus groups, and then we would move them, the students to a new size table and do the same thing for three weeks, and then do it again for three weeks, and again for three weeks. Turns out the students actually prefer the bigger tables because they have so much room, but they're not very space efficient. You've got these large areas in the center of the table that's not used, and worse yet, the, if you have a 10-foot table, for example, well, for students to have a conversation clear across the 10-foot space, they have to speak pretty loudly, and if they have to talk loudly, that makes it noisier in the room which means that people at the next big table have to talk loudly, and it just blows up. So we tried all kinds of sizes. The six-foot size we were hoping would work because that's the standard size. You know, In fact, uh, when we were t didn't have to build any six-foot tables, we just borrowed them from a hotel because they were six-foot rounds, which is standard. Um, the problem with them is that they're too close together. Uh, they, uh, six foot, uh, at a, when you go to a hotel for a banquet, you'll have ten people at a six-foot table, but you know, you're, you're really close together, and if you are trying to take notes, and if there might be some equipment out there, and if there's a few laptops, quickly gets out of hand, so seven-foot tables are the best. Other technology, there are three laptops, one, at, uh, one laptop for each group of three students. We tried three laptops per team of three, two laptops per team of three, and one laptop per team of three. We tested this and observed, and what we found was Three laptops per team breaks the team apart because every student goes their own way. Two laptops is actually worse because then there's one poor student of the three who doesn't have a computer and they feel left out. So if there's one laptop per team, that forces them to collaborate, if nothing else, to decide on which, what Facebook page to go to. But it does for, sharing that resource does force them to collaborate. So that's important. Some people use smart boards. I have not. I used to use a tablet, and I stopped using it because I found I was talking too much. A document camera is usually fairly handy. A, a lot of schools have a separate uh, LCD screen for each table, and uh, some of the really fancy places uh, have that where students can plug into that and display their group's laptop up on that screen, and then the teacher can grab that and display it all the way around the classroom so that that one group can explain their work to everyone. So that works out pretty nicely. All right, let's see if we have another question here. How do you describe the difference in the classroom climate, particularly regarding disruption and discipline issues for K-12? The interesting thing about a uh, scale-up classroom is that all those difficult problems are handled by the students. One thing that the first activity that I have students do when I first assign them to teams, which I do three or four times a semester, is they have to write a group contract. What do they agree to do to succeed? And once they've written that, then all the problems are out of my hands. If, if a student doesn't come to class, and I get an email from, from somebody who has been there faithfully and said, you know, they're saying, hey, Joe, and our group isn't coming to class. My response is, is there anything about that in your contract? And if not, there's nothing you can do about it. And the next time they write a contract, it's going to be much better. If there is something in the contract about that, then you need to talk to Joe and say, Joe, you need to come to class. You agreed to do this. And if they don't come, they can be fired from the group, which sounds a little silly, but the people who are, you know, who are loafing, they're trying to avoid work. And if they get fired from a group, they are still responsible for a whole group's worth, work of, worth of work. So that's three times. They just triple their workload by goofing off. So we've had very, very few people fired. Things like attendance. I don't require attendance in my class, and it averages 93%. And in fact, you can see when, there's, when someone's not there, the other teammates are texting them, saying, hey, where are you? We need you to come to class. 
and it's so it's no longer my problem. So uh, I, I'm hoping it would be interesting to see. There are a few high school places that are doing this. They have not reported any difficulties, but uh, it certainly will be something that we want to look at more closely. Uh, let's see. Has scale been able to be implemented in any room type? I'm not sure what that means. If you are doing this in a uh, lecture hall, uh, you know, remodeling a lecture hall, everything depends on what the floor is made out of. If it's, you know, if it's a stadium-style floor, if it's made of concrete, you're sort of in trouble. If it's plywood, you can tear it out to make a flat floor. Some places actually have terraced, so they have, uh, you know, several places that are w just wide enough for one table. And then there's a step in another area wide enough for one table. I mean, you might have a few scattered side to side. But the idea is they can make a terrace like that and turn a lecture hall into this sort of space. Basically, the closer to square you are, the more uh, you will find this works. Students need to be able to see each other and to see each other's work. Uh, there's lots of times there's a column in the way, something like that. And that hasn't been as much of an issue as you might think, uh, which has surprised me. Let's see. How do teacher student and student student relationships oops, change during the model? Uh, there's a uh, we've actually studied this. We've studied students' expectations before they come to class, after we explain it to them, and then at the end of the semester, and we find they get to be much much better friends. In fact, we had to revise things. We used to leave them in the same groups all semester long, uh, but what would happen is they they work together in class like for five hours a week. And then they would work together outside of class on homework, and they got to be good friends, and they started going to movies and basketball games and parties. And pretty soon, when they come to class, they had so much to talk about that wasn't class material that the, that started to get out of hand. So then we said, well, let's put them in new groups halfway through the semester. And that didn't work because they were still really good friends. We actually had some marriages come out of scale-up classes. Uh, so now we put them in new groups every three or four weeks. And that seems to be sort of the ideal. They get it. They get in a group long enough to, to get the group functioning. You know, if you're familiar with this, the you know, forming and norming and storming and all that kind of stuff and performing, but they don't get to be such good friends that they're they're lifelong buddies. And of course, they get to know the, the teacher very well. I first realized this when I was taking some data where I was comparing traditional tests to uh, tests written by lecturing faculty. I gave those tests to my students so I could compare. Scale-up students did a letter grade better on the other teachers' tests than their own students did. Uh, but when I was doing that, I uh, had to give the test at night because of security reasons. And I remember walking into the lecture hall that I had taught in many times before. And I looked up at my scale-up students who, you know, their classroom was, was in use, so they had to be in this lecture hall to take the test. I looked up and I realized I knew every single student by name and I could predict their test grade within five points. So there's a lot different connection to the teacher. And I think that's also part of why students do so much better, is that they know that they're disappointing me, and they know that I care. I mean, there's that relationship building. So I guess we're about out of time. If you have any questions about Scale Up, uh, I would be glad to, uh, to talk with you by phone or by email. Uh, certainly take a look at the Scale Up website. That's a good place to get started. I appreciate your attention, and uh, talk to you later. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Robert Beekner, and our participants for joining our webinar today. We hope you will join the ASEF mailing list to ensure you are updated on ASEF services and opportunities. Remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to your feedback.